Hello and welcome back to the course on deep learning. In today's tutorial, we will continue exploring how self-organizing maps learn. So previously we stopped at this image. We found out how the best matching units or BMUs are updated and how everything around them is also updated when they find rows which they match up to. And today we're going to have a look at a bit of a more sophisticated example when we have several best matching units, for instance, five in this case. So let's get started. So as we discussed, these BMUs are going to be updated to be even closer to the rows that they matched up to. And then each one of these BMUs is going to be assigned a area around it. And that area is going to be calculated through a radius. And this is what it looks like. And by the way, here we can see that there are some values that don't fall under the radius. That usually doesn't happen in self-organizing maps. This is just our visual example. Uh, normally the radius at the start is selected as quite large so it encompasses uh, nearly the whole self-organizing map and the thing that happens here is first of all all of the nodes that fall into these areas are updated as we saw previously so let's go through these from uh, from the top to the bottom. So for example for the purple node there we go all of those nodes are updated so first of all the purple node itself is updated to be closer to that row that it matched up to as the BMU. And then all of those other nodes that fall into that radius are updated. So it drags them along with itself. Then for the blue node, same thing happens. Same thing happens for the green node. Same thing happens for the red node. And same thing happens for the orange node. So they all are dragged closer and closer. And there's a bit of a resistance or push and pull between them because some, for instance, the blue node is dragging this row, this node that way, the orange node is dragging it that way, and the red node is dragging it that way, green node is dragging it that way. It's a bit of a battle between them, but that's normal. That's what happens in the self-organizing map. And that happens, for instance, in your, uh, so you go through all of your rows in your data set and, and all of these updates happen. And then as you have a new epoch, or so you go through your rows again, uh, what happens is a unique feature of the Cohonen uh, learning algorithm is applied. And what that is, is that your radiuses actually shrink. So in your next iteration, what happens is the radiuses become a bit smaller. And this time, when you're going through your data set, um, your best matching units, they're actually pulling not on as many nodes in your self-organizing map. So this time only these nodes are pulled, these ones then these ones, these ones, these ones. And then again, the radiuses shrink. And this time, these nodes uh, are pulled, these nodes are pulled, these nodes are pulled, these nodes are pulled, and these nodes are pulled. So the process becomes more and more accurate as you go through your data set again and again and again. And if at the start you were just trying to get your whole, all of your self-organized maps very close to your data and roughly on the surface of your data, as we can see, in this example, so at the start you were just trying to get anywhere near your data. Then as you go through and through through more and more and more uh, iterations, what happens is you are adjusting your self-organizing map in a more precise, in a more la laser-specific manner. You're adjusting, okay, little edge over here, little bump over here. I need to, this needs to adjust a little bit, this needs to adjust a little bit. So you're becoming more and more specific and targeted in your approach. And that's exactly how your self-organizing map slowly but surely um, goes over your data and becomes a kind of like a mask for your data as we can see in this example over here. And so in our visual representation, what that would look like is uh, here's our data and then through lots and lots of iterations, our self-organizing map might look like something like this where there's been some battle between the different nodes and where different nodes should be assigned to, should they be green or blue, but or purple or orange or red, and then eventually we've come to settled it to some kind of representation. So hopefully that was useful. Now you have a good intuitive understanding of how self-organizing maps work and learn. And now let's go through a couple of things that are important to remember as takeaways from this tutorial. So a couple of things that are important to know. Uh, number one, SOMS retain topology of your input set. As we could see, from the image where the map is slowly becoming like a mask of your data, your data might have some topology. There might be some interrelations in your data. Well, the self-organizing map does everything it can, it possibly can, to be a 
uh, as close to your data as possible and become like like a mask for your data and therefore it will retain the topology of your inputs and that is very very important very valuable for us in terms of understanding our data set better uh, next is that SOMs actually reveal correlations that are not easily identified. As you can imagine, if you have 20 or 30 or 50 or 100 or even hundreds of columns in your data set, it can be very challenging to assess any kind of correlations or similarities that might be present in your data set. Whereas a self-organizing map can neatly put it all, analyze all of that for you and then put all of that for you into a map and you'll be able to see those things from the map very easily. SOMs classify data without supervision. And this is an important um, aspect. As we discussed, we are now venturing into the space of unsupervised deep learning. And as you can see, self-organizing maps don't actually need any labels. For instance, in convolutional neural networks, we discussed that we need to train our data set to, in order for it to recognize objects, it has to first be told that these are cats and these are dogs. And then after lots and lots of iterations, it will know how to recognize a cat from a dog. Whereas here, we don't need any labels, we don't need any supervision. The self-organizing map will on its own extract features and very often it'll extract features which, uh, or show us features, dependencies, and uh, similarities, correlations, which we are not even expecting and we'll, therefore will be very, very surprised. So that's uh, a very important aspect of self-organized maps. They can be used in scenarios where you don't actually know what you're looking for, but you know that you want to find any kind of correlations in your data. SOMs don't require a target vector. Uh, that's the same thing as that they don't need supervision. And as a result of that, they don't, there is no process of backpropagation. There is no backpropagation in the training of a self-organizing map. As you as you remember in artificial neural networks, we would the data would go through the network, we would get a result, we would compare it to the target vector, we would find the error, and then we'd backpropagate that error through the network to update the weights. Well, here none of that happens because we don't actually have a target vector. There is no error to backpropagate. And also there's no lateral connections between your output nodes. It's important to just remember that, as you could see, we didn't actually need any connection between the nodes. The only thing that happens between the nodes is that when you pull on one node, they, the other ones get pulled, but that is through the close ones get pulled, but that is through the, the radius and the area that we outlined in yellow that allows us to, uh, allows this, facilitates this whole process. When we say that there's no connections, no lateral connections between the output nodes means that there's no actual uh, neural network type of connections there's no activation functions between them and so on and why it's important to mention is because sometimes you'll see images where the nodes are connected in the output that there there's a like a grid behind the nodes the reason for that is they're just showing that these are indeed nodes on a self-organizing map these are the output nodes and that they might be they might be just nicely neatly organized into a map but that's pretty much it there is no actual uh, formulas or equations going on between those nodes that's also important to remember so there we go that's uh, how self-organizing maps learn and if you'd like to uh, study this a bit more with some soft introduction into mathematics the mathematics behind self-organizing maps as you could see is, is very straightforward it's very simple there's, there's a couple of additional things about the how the radius changes and how the uh, weights are updated based on how close on the proximity to your best matching unit but generally, the mathematics is, I would say, the simplest out of all of the neural networks that we're discussing in this course. So if you'd like to study the math a little bit and also get some introduction to programming, self-organizing maps, a great blog or several blogs actually on this topic uh, are available at aijunkie.com. So here's a link by Matt Buckland. Not sure about the year, if it's 2004 or not. And the post is called Cohonen's Self-Organizing Feature Maps great read and you will get a very uh, gentle introduction into self-organizing maps from there. Now make sure to check out these videos on the right or the full course in the description to continue your learning and I look forward to seeing you there.